What's up, everybody? My name is Charlie Ungemach. If you're familiar with the podcast, you know who I am. I'm a founder and curator of Gird Up. Uh, just a big shout out and a thank you to everybody who supports the show. I uh, continues to do work with the show. Whether you're one of the guys who has actually been on the show as a guest, huge thank you and shout out to those guys. Or whether you're just somebody who listens to the show and appreciates and enjoys it, shout out also to all the ladies who listen to the show because I know there are several of you. Um, God has continued. Continue to bless me through the opportunity to put this show together uh, to help me grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's a few life changes going on, and at the risk of sounding like a uh, teenage drama queen with a YouTube channel, I'm going to share my story with you right after this. Here we go. You are listening to the Gird Up Podcast. To gird up is an ancient way of preparing oneself for hard work or a battle ahead. Our work is to reclaim masculinity in the modern world and to live out our calling as men of God. Here you will find a community of believers working hard to become the men that God created us to be. Now it's time to roll up your sleeves and let's get to work. All right, like I said, I'm going to give you a life update. I'm at the risk of sounding like a... Uh, drama queen from from the YouTube world. I don't usually do this just because um, I only have one story. I can only tell my story one time. Otherwise, I use it up. Um, and also because you guys don't tune in to hear what's going on in my life, you can tune in uh, to hear what the Lord is doing um, in the lives of great men around the world and great men of the Bible. And that's what I want to provide to you. But I think that my story is valuable. I've also got a lot of questions because there are some people who have found out that I've made a significant life change here. And they're asking me a lot of questions why I chose to do what I'm doing um, and what's going on. So I figured I'd share with you. Hopefully my story can be one of encouragement um, and one of hope um, and one that helps other people grow and learn to love the Lord uh, as we ought. So we're going to start at the beginning. A long time ago, in a far, far away land called La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a joke. It's right next to us. Anyway, uh, in La Crosse, I grew up in a pastor's family. We grew up in a parsonage. And I was surrounded every single day with wonderful men of God who genuinely loved me, genuinely loved my family, uh, my parents, and my siblings, and genuinely wanted to help us grow up in grace and knowledge of the truth. I couldn't have asked for a better childhood, um, particularly in that regard. We certainly had struggles, and there were times that were tough and hard, and there were things, we had some, you know, things happen. Um, but it was a wonderful place to grow up as a boy. Um, we used to, you used to ride our bikes around town and mom would literally say like, don't leave the town, don't leave the city of La Crosse when we were riding our bikes. It's that kind of place that we grew up in. Um, we had friends all over the block and all over the neighborhood. We'd go hang out at their houses and we had epic cap gun battles and cowboys and Indians and we reenacted all our favorite movies and all kinds of things. It was a great way to grow up and I was, most importantly I was surrounded by men of God who genuinely loved the Lord, genu genuinely loved me. Um, and dads are incredibly important, the most important figure in any boy's life. Uh, but oftentimes we neglect to thank uh, the other men in our lives because one man can't raise a great man. It takes a community of men. And that's exactly what I had as a kid. Um, and I thank God for it. And then when I was in uh, going into eighth grade, we moved. And then I got to be really close to both of my grandfathers and close to my dad and even more men of God. It was a wonderful way to grow up. And when I was done uh, with high school, I went off to Martin Luther College. I found myself in a new city, in a new place. Um, and found myself looking around me, realizing that the network of men I had grown up with was kind of gone and looking for something like that for myself. And I realized very quickly that there weren't a whole lot of guys like the guys I grew up with surrounding me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I found myself Googling, what does it mean to be a man? And uh, as you, I'm sure, know, the things that pop up on Google aren't necessarily helpful and aren't always necessarily relevant. And this is before the modern men's movement really started. It more kicked off um, in the last few years. And so there's only one resource I really found online that talked about being a man that wasn't all about, you know, like getting laid and having your apartment ready for the one night stand and all that kind of nonsense. Um, and it was the art of manliness. But the art of manliness is put out by uh, a, a wonderful man, but he's, I believe he's LDS, Latter-day Saints. He's Mormon. Um, and uh, he didn't talk about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. He didn't talk about Christianity. It wasn't a major part of what he was doing. Um, and so slowly over time, I started seeking out other opportunities to know and love 
Jesus better to understand who I was as a man. Um, we started doing internships and interacting with different people and people told me to read certain books and I started reading some of the classic books. Uh, everything from Teddy Roosevelt's The Rough Riders to John Eldridge to Stephen Mansfield. Reading all kinds of books and slowly but surely learned, I think, for the first time explicitly what it really does mean to be a man of God. Um, I had been seeing examples of it for my entire life, but nobody had ever annotated it to me uh, the way I was looking for in kind of a scholarly fashion. That was super exciting to see that start to happen and watch myself develop and grow. And I brought a lot of friends with me too. Um, I think I can say without too much pride and without conjecting too much on myself that I had a bunch of buddies um, who I kind of dragged along with me into this journey and we got headed in the right direction. And by the time I graduated from college, um, Man, we had some awesome things going on. We had prayer groups going together and men's Bible studies, and we were in chapel together. We'd sit together. We'd eat together. We'd live together. I had this community of believers and brothers that was with me all the time. Uh, but as I got to the end of my college experience, my student teaching honestly didn't go as hot as I would have hoped. I actually almost failed it. Um, and then I had a couple of other issues right at the end of my college career, and my world kind of started to crash around, down around my ears. And I began to think, you know, if I'm going to make it, I better better get my act together and the emphasis all became about me and so entering the call process for the first time uh, I tried to control the process as much as I as much as I could as much as I as was possible and for those of you who are familiar with the call process you might think that that's not possible but you would be wrong um, you can have a significant amount of emphasis uh, of, of you can have a significant amount of sway as to which calls come your direction if you're manipulating it up to do so, and I certainly was, and so was the school that wanted me. In fact, at one point, the principal even said to me, Hey, Charlie, if they don't assign you to us, we'll just hire you anyway. You can resign the call they give you, and we'll bring you here. Don't do that, pastors and principals. It's, don't. It's just setting yourself up for failure and setting the, the, the young person up for failure as well. Uh, but within all of this, I had lost confidence in myself as, as a man of God and as as a, as a teacher, I had been really arrogant, I think, about being a teacher coming into it. Uh, I thought it was going to be easy, and I was somebody who, from childhood, flew by the seat of my pants, which, frankly, has become, in many ways, a good thing. It makes me really flexible, it makes me uh, able to kind of go with the flow, and I don't always need to have a plan, which a lot of people are paralyzed in fear when they don't have a plan. That's not me at all. Um, and that is a huge blessing, a huge spiritual gift at times. It's not a great spiritual gift when you're starting a new career. It's not a great spiritual gift when you're entering a field that you're really not prepared for. Um, and so when I got to my first school, um, I actually did really well teaching. Um, statistically, according to the map tests that we took, uh, we had the high, my fourth grade classroom my first year of teaching had the highest rate of growth of any fourth grade classroom in the city of Milwaukee, which is really exciting. It's not as cool as it sounds because we weren't the highest performing group. And I also acknowledge that they gave me all the smartest kids and all the best behaved kids. So it's not like I was some you know phenomenal teacher and everybody should make a movie about me. Um, but I was successful. The problem was I didn't do it the way they wanted me to do it. Um, school cultures are really, really, really important. Like It's a really important thing to make sure you have a cohesive school culture across uh, the school and this particular school it was a it was a, as a elementary school and all elementary school had lots of different classrooms and they all had a very similar teaching model and they all had a very similar teaching strategy and teaching style and they were very very good at it but it wasn't my strategy it wasn't my teaching style and for a while I tried to fit in um, and do what they wanted me to do and after a while I said you know what I just it's not me I can't do this and I did it the way I wanted to do it and you can have an argument about whether that's right or wrong or whether I did the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, in the end, that school year was very successful for me and my students, but I didn't do it the way that my faculty wanted me to do it. And so we decided to make some changes. The next school year I got to teach Word of God. So a fifth and sixth grade classroom um, and was super excited about it. We bought a new curriculum. We did all kinds of awesome things um, in the summer to get ready for it. And once we started, I realized very quickly that the kids in my classrooms weren't ready for the catechism that we were throwing at them. Most of these kids were right off the street. They'd never had any official and formal uh, Christian education before. Um, and if they had, it was limited and it, they weren't ready for fifth and sixth grade catechism class. And it became very quickly apparent that uh, we weren't going to be able to teach the way we wanted to. And so it fell upon me um, and also upon my arrogance, frankly, um, to prepare a curriculum that they would be able to follow so that they'd be ready for catechism when it came to the next level. Um, and so for the first time in my life I was forced 
to get into daily Bible reading and daily Bible study. I dug into it to myself, uh, like for myself for the first time. I wasn't just depending on other people to lead me spiritually, but I, I genuinely jumped in and grabbed my spiritual life by the horns um, and got an opportunity to share some wonderful messages of truth and peace with my students. The problem was I bit off more than I could chew um, and I still wasn't doing it the, the way they wanted me to. And by the end of the school year, everything was kind of going wrong. I was yelling at kids. I was losing my self-control. I was having anxiety attacks on Sunday thinking about what was going to happen on Monday and eventually I lost my Saturdays too because I would spend all day Saturday dreading the anxiety on Sunday because of Monday. The whole world kind of came crashing down. I lost my effectiveness as a teacher. Um, by the end of the school year, the school and I agreed that it was time to part ways and find a better fit. And, and that's not to say that I wasn't successful at what I did. In fact, I was incredibly successful at what I did. The basketball teams that I coached were the best in the history of the school. Um, I had incredibly high-performing classrooms, and I brought the word of Jesus to a whole bunch of kids who had never heard him before and helped them build personal relationships with the Heavenly Father. But I made it all about me, and since I was making it all about me, I very, very quickly ran out of steam. Um, and the Lord humbled me. He took all the opportunities I had and put me in a different school. And that school was a very different environment. Um, that school uh, is a good place to be. It's a great place to send your kids, but it's a very different style, very different, very different place. And I had the freedom and the opportunity to be myself, um, to figure out my teaching style and really um, take ownership of myself. And I learned a lot of lessons that way. Um, and uh, I was blessed to have the opportunity to kind of step back away from my life and take <laughs> take stock of what was going around in my life, kind of take inventory of myself. And I realized very quickly that there were a lot of things going on that I didn't like. Um, I realized that uh, my, fr my friends and I were going out way too often, spending way too much money on, on all kinds of things we didn't really need to spend money on. I maxed out a credit card with my kind of loose and wild living. Um, my roommate was smoking weed and doing drugs on the front porch. I was bringing girls home at all hours of the night. There were people who owed me money. I was just getting taken advantage of right and left. We lived in an absolute dump of an apartment. I can't believe that I actually like, consented to live there. There were so many things going on that I didn't like. And I looked around me, and you've heard me say before, I didn't like what was going on in my life. I realized I wasn't the man I wanted to be. I looked around and realized I wasn't doing anything to become the man that I wanted to be someday. And there weren't a whole lot of guys in my life that really weren't any men in my life at that moment on a daily basis uh, who I wanted to emulate, who I wanted to be like. So I did a couple of things. First, I moved out of that apartment frankly, found a new group of friends, um, really limited the number of people who had an influence on my life, rekindled a bunch of old friendships uh, that I'd kind of let go and brought those men of God back into my life. I started reading like crazy. First, it was just daily Bible study. Remember, I had, I had started that about a year before, but now I really got intense about it and made it a habit um, and a daily part of my, my routine. Uh, I started reading books by John Eldridge and Stephen Mansfield. I read all, I read literally hundreds of books uh, about masculinity and about Christianity um, and listened to audiobooks and podcasts. Uh, at the time, I was listening to a ton of The Art of Manliness. I was listening to Order of Man, The Great Man podcast, The Pursuit of Manliness podcast. Listened to all these different podcasts, reading all these different books, learning more and more about what other people and their relationships with God were like, learning more and more about what uh, other people's experiences were and growing to understand more and more um, my relationship with my Savior and my relationship with the world um, and what the Lord was doing in my life. And sooner or later, I also decided I wanted to share this <laughs> with people around me and with the whole world, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. That's where the podcast came from. And in the last three ish years, I guess it was a little more than three years ago that we started, um, we've reached more, we've had more than 50,000 downloads. We've reached um, the est you can't really tell exactly how many people you've reached, but um, conservative estimates would say we've probably reached about 80,000 people or more around the world. We've had downloads on every single continent except for Antarctica, so if you know anybody in Antarctica, tell them to download the Great Up Podcast. <laughs> um, we've been able to go to all kinds of different men's conferences and retreats, meet all kinds of people, and interview about 100 men now um, who are men of God, who are great examples of, of lives of Christian service. Um, and I certainly have grown as a man as well. Uh, one of those things that I experienced, one of those places where I experienced a lot of growth in the last uh, year or two, started last summer. I, 
I uh, made it my goal for the summer to know Jesus like I'd never known before. I felt like I didn't have a really good personal and intimate relationship with God, uh, with my Heavenly Father, and so I set out to get to know Him better. I was reading C.S. Lewis. Um, I read through the portions of the Bible that I'd never actually sat down and read before, and most people haven't actually read the Bible from cover to cover. I'm not saying you need to start at Genesis and go all the way to the end, but there are probably sections of the Bible that you've never actually sat down and read. So my project last summer was to read those, um, to build on my, my prayer life, to really expand my prayer life. If you were following me on Instagram at the time, I posted my prayers every single day as accountability for myself and for other people uh, to see what I was praying about and see what I was praying on. And as I was growing, it became laid on my heart, the Spirit kind of whispered to my heart that I needed to be more humble, that I was very, very proud. And that was true. It was absolutely true. You can hear it in my podcast from, that, from around that time. Um, I was definitely acting like it. Um, I was becoming similar to the way I was my first couple of years of teaching. I was going back to that mindset of, I'm going to get this on my own. I'm going to be God's gift to mankind. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be great. Um, and so I began to pray for humility, which, by the way, is a very dangerous prayer. Don't pray that prayer unless you really mean it, because the Lord's going to take that prayer very seriously. And uh, there are some ways that life got rough real quickly. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the gritty details with you, but the Lord changed my life significantly very quickly after that. Um, and I learned to listen to his voice calling. And the more and more I prayed, the more and more I asked for humility, the more and more I felt the Lord whispering to my heart, well, why don't you follow me? You're pursuing all kinds of other things. You're doing all kinds of other things. You're claiming to follow me, but are you really doing it in your heart? And I realized very quickly after he started saying that, that he was right, which the Lord usually is right. Um, and I wasn't following with my whole heart. I wasn't humble as I should be. I, I was making it all about me all the time. <clears throat> all the time. And so, continuing to pray for humility, continuing to pray that I would know God as He truly is, uh, continuing to pray that I would see myself as the Lord sees me, um, and that I might genuinely be humble and kind. Uh, and as I continued to pray and as I continued to study, the Lord blessed me with more and more of the gifts of the Spirit, of the fruits of the Spirit. Um, and I can genuinely say that I've never had a relationship with the Lord like I have right now. Um, and, and in that relationship, um, the Lord continues to continues to lead me to do things I would have never thought I would have done, things that I would have never uh, imagined myself doing, things that I have for years and years refused to do, um, refused even to consider. Um, but the Lord keeps working on my heart. At first, He simply said, "You know, are you willing to go where I lead you?" And uh, I thought the answer was yes, but the reality was the answer was ah, maybe not yet. Um, and so I felt this calling on my heart, get rid of everything and follow me, right? Are you willing to leave everything behind to follow me? And as crazy as this might sound, as radical as this might sound, and frankly, it is a little bit crazy and radical, I started listing all my possessions on Facebook Marketplace. And some of them sold, some of them didn't, some of them have come with me to my new place here. Um, but uh, I think the Lord was, was asking me, are you ready? And when I demonstrated I was, I started asking the next question. The next question was, will you go where I lead you? I think my answer again was, yeah, at some point, but I'm not quite ready yet. Um, and he started whispering, there's other ministry you want to do. And, and I've talked about on the podcast before and talked about for pretty much the whole time I've been in ministry that I love kids. I enjoy teaching. I've gotten pretty good at teaching, I think. Um, but my heart is for ministry, full-time ministry, doing um, ministry, uh, particularly ministering to ministers, helping other men of God know and love the Lord better so that they can continue to to serve whatever group of people that they serve, whether they're just dads serving their families, leaders in the community, leaders in the church. I want to help those men know God better. Um, and it's hard to do that when you're a full-time teacher. So the Lord continued to lay on my heart that he was calling me to something. And, and all of a sudden, at the end of last summer, I had three different people in the same week walk up to me and say, why aren't you a pastor yet? Or when are you going to become a pastor? And my response to every single one of them was, never. I'm not doing that. Why would I do that? Uh, but something had changed in my heart. I think I was willing to listen a little bit better than I was before. Uh, and uh, the Lord was speaking to me, I think. Uh, the Lord doesn't speak to everybody the same way. He certainly doesn't uh, approach all people the same way. But the Lord certainly was calling me. The Lord certainly was laying something on my heart, but I refused to listen. 
Um, and so as the Lord continued to push me in that direction, I was sitting in meetings and thought, you know, somebody ought to do this better. <laughs> and immediately my heart says, yeah, maybe you should. Um, and I just slowly started moving in that direction. And uh, a couple of months later, the Lord laid it on my heart again. He said, Charlie, you need to be a pastor. And I said, all right, fine, I'll be a pastor, but I'm not going to do it yet. And I actually made plans for the next school year, for the next couple of school years. Uh, we had plans to do new ministry where I was at and to continue things going in that direction. And the Lord continued to call. The Lord continued to lean on my heart. And he said, no, Charlie, I need you to go now. I want you to go now. I said, well, fine. But I'm not going to be a pastor. I'm going to be a staff minister. So I started talking to MLC about the staff ministry program and, and uh, got you know some information about it. And very quickly in conversations and then looking at the program decided that's not that's not what I wanted to do um, and so that kind of died and I went back to my plans for the next couple of school years the Lord kept leaning on my heart the Lord kept pushing me kept nudging me kept giving me the shoulder right um, and sooner or later I started pursuing uh, going back to school to become a pastor and this is where I am and this is what I'm doing so I resigned my call at the end of the school year um, and have now moved to New Ulm. This is my new apartment. You can see all the fancy wood paneling from the 70s on the walls. Um, I am now in New Ulm, Minnesota full time. Uh, looking for a job, going back to school, ready to study Greek and Hebrew. Um, it's not what I ever expected I would be doing. It's not where I thought I was going to be. And again, I'm starting to sound like one of those YouTube uh, phenoms who has to give life updates on everything all the time. But it's legitimately someplace I thought I'd never be and something I thought I would never be doing. I outright refused to do it for many, many years. And I don't think that the Lord was just waiting for me to be ready. I think uh, I wasn't ready, and I don't think I would have been an effective student or minister um, where I was at before. Um, but as I've continued to get to know the Lord better, the Lord has led me to do different things, and this is one of those things. And so, with that being said, that's my story so far. Um, I, would, I would argue that there are three big lessons that I've learned um, so far on my journey. And the first is that uh, if I'm not 100% living for Jesus, then I'm living for myself. There's a whole lot of people that claim to live for Jesus, that claim to be serving Him, that claim to be walking in His footsteps and in His path, that claim to be following His will for their lives, but really deep down it's all about them. And I can say that from experience, my whole uh, first two years of teaching were all about me. It was all about what I could do, what I wanted to prove, what I was going to do for the kingdom, how great I was going to be in God's name. But I left Jesus completely out of the picture. I really didn't have a spiritual life. I really wasn't uh, asking the Lord what he would have me do. I simply was telling the Lord what I want to do <laughs> and then expecting him to do it in my life. And, and that's just not how God works. That's not how our spiritual lives work. Um, and it's not a healthy way to view our Heavenly Father. Um, the only way to really truly live for God is to just give him everything and to Turn it all over to Him and let Him lead and let Him guide. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you're going, no matter what your vocation is, whether you're a plumber, a pastor, a farmer, a gardener, you know, a, a cashier at Walmart, whatever you're doing, um, the only way to really truly follow your Heavenly Father is to just give it all to Him. And that would be the second lesson, too, is that complete surrender to our Heavenly Father, to the will of the Father, doesn't mean that I forfeit all my choices and all my dreams and all my, you know, whatever, and I leave everything to go be a pastor. That's what it happened to be for me. Um, the Lord has given me some very special gifts in that regard, and He's asked me to go follow Him, and that's, that's where I'm going to go. Uh, but to be uh, totally honest with you, I'm not sure I want to be a parish pastor. I don't really see myself ever being a parish pastor. But you never know what the Lord will do in my heart. We'll never know what the Lord will do with me in the future. He certainly may give me that job. Um, and if he does, he'll bless it. Um, but that, that's not the point. It's, it's not the outcome in mind. The outcome I have in mind is knowing my Heavenly Father better. And if you truly pursue that, if you truly choose to follow your Heavenly Father, if you truly seek to know God better, he will bless your efforts. He absolutely will. You will know him better if you choose to know him better. Uh, and, and so... That would be the second point, is that surrender to um, the will of the Father doesn't mean that I give up everything I want for my life. God designed each one of us with special enthusiasms, with special gifts, uh, with things in mind that make us happy, that set us on fire, that, that light us up uh, with joy and with excitement. And He wants us to pursue those things. 
Some people really love working with their hands and building things. I, go ahead, be a carpenter, go be a plumber, go build houses, go build churches, you know, go restore great buildings of history. Use the gifts that God has given you. Um, some people are excellent teachers and, and more power to them. I've been a teacher. I can say it's an incredibly difficult job to have and underappreciated. But if you love kids and you like being organized, go be a teacher, right? Do things that light you up because God has provided people to do absolutely every job. There are people out there who were just born to be garbage men, man. They love keeping the city clean. They love driving the truck. They have great interest in micro microbiology and all kinds of that stuff. And they were just born to be garbage men. So go be a garbage man. Go do what God wants you to do. Don't so many people believe nowadays that you have to kill the desires of your heart in order to follow God or in order to do your duty for the for the community or whatever it is. You don't. You don't. Follow the prompting of the Spirit. He's not going to have you do anything that's not good for you. Right? So surrender to God's will doesn't mean that I give up all my choices and don't make any choices for myself anymore and just I'm a rag doll battered in the wind. That's not it at all. It means that I am in tune with the will of my Heavenly Father. I recognize the gifts and strengths that I have, and I find a way to unite my God-given passions with a God-given mission, and we do those things together. Right? The third lesson that I've certainly learned throughout this journey um, is that God speaks to everybody differently. I said this earlier in the podcast, um, but God doesn't always speak to people the same way. And, and any time that I hear somebody say, I heard the voice of God saying to me, it really makes me nervous um, and it really makes it hard to believe. One of my favorite authors uh, talks about the idea that every time in scripture that God talks to somebody or an angel appears to someone and talks, they cower in fear, they fade away, they hide. Um, so anytime I hear that somebody says that God is speaking directly to them or that they're speaking in tongues or that kind of thing, it always, it always makes me nervous and, and it's very hard for me to believe them because that's just not the, the people that we know for sure have had an encounter like that with God. We're absolutely terrified of God's presence and of God's face. Um, but that's not to say that God doesn't speak through people. When God talks to me, it's usually through through a book. I, 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 when I'm reading, I'll just hear the Lord whisper into my heart, right? Or it also happens to me oftentimes when I'm on a walk or when I'm saying my prayers. It's just this quiet nudging, a quiet push in a certain direction. It might just be a strong conviction, and I say, Lord, where is this conviction coming from? And the conviction just grows stronger. The Lord does speak to us, but he speaks to us each intimately and privately. He's not shouting from the rooftops, and he's certainly not showing up um, and speaking to us as if we're equals with him. And so we got to throw that nonsense away, but it doesn't mean that the Lord isn't talking to you. It doesn't mean that you're not having a two-way conversation with our Heavenly Father. Um, and it's important to remember that. And it's important to not uh, feel, A, feel pressured to hear something from the Lord because that's when people do crazy things in the Lord's name because they hear voices that aren't really actually the Lord's and they try and follow them. Um, but also, not to just, I mean, so many people dismiss, I think, the word of the Lord when they hear it um, because they're convinced that it can't really happen. God works um, in incredible and uh, wonderful ways, and he certainly would speak to you if you would let him. Um, and so with that, my encouragement is simple. Follow the Lord. Follow where he leads. Give everything up to him. Um, surrender yourself to him. Uh, and, and do what makes you happy. Do it. Do what genuinely gives you joy, uh, whether it's professionally or just on the side. Do what gives you joy, what gives you pleasure, what gives you happiness, um, and find a way to tie that to a mission. Um, find a way to tie that to God's will for your life, um, and He will He will continue to bless it. With all that being said, um, I hope, I sincerely hope that I'll be able to continue to give you guys um, awesome content as I go through my next college experience here. It's going to take me six years to get to the seminary, so uh, I hope that I have the opportunity to continue to share this with you. Um, I don't usually ask you guys for money, um, and I don't plan on asking you guys for money now, but the reality is I'm going to have to work a couple of part-time jobs as well as going to school in order to make it through <laughs> uh, the next couple of years and my time is going to be limited. So if you find it on your heart uh, to donate to the podcast, you can do that. All the information is at the end of the show, or you can just reach out to me. Um, uh, it would be a tremendous blessing, again, only if you, only if the Lord really lays it on your heart, and if you, if you genuinely uh, believe 
in what we're doing and, and you want to see it continue to grow. Um, but the Lord has never let me down. That came out wrong. You know what I mean. Uh, the Lord has continued to bless. This is not the first time that we've been uh, looking at a money shortage. Um, the Lord has always made the funds come through. We've never had to stop making content. We've never run out of time. We've never run out of money, and I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Um, but if you choose to be a blessing to the podcast to help me get more information out to the world, to help me keep making podcasts, you certainly are welcome to make a donation. I would appreciate that. It'll help me uh, continue to have time and the ability to give more content to you. Second thing is, if you ever ever in New Ulm, man, you make sure you look me up. I've been saying that about Milwaukee forever, and several people have. Uh, I've been blessed to meet a whole bunch of people who I would have never met if they hadn't sent me a Facebook message or texted me or sent me an email and said, hey, I think you're cool. I'd love to meet you. Keep on doing that if you're up at MLC, uh, if you're up in New Ulm, or if you're up in the cities or wherever, and you want to connect, let me know, and I'll do my very best to connect with you, carve out some time for you, and get to know you better, maybe even podcast with you. Um, and last but not least, please keep me in your prayers. Please keep MLC in your prayers. Um, and uh, keep praying that the Lord prepares people who genuinely love Him, who genuinely want to serve Him, uh, to serve in a public ministry. If you don't know, we do have, across not just our church body as the Wells, but across all church bodies, there's a dramatic shortage in pastors, there's a dramatic shortage in parochial school teachers. Um, and so if you know people in your life uh, who are in ministry or who are preparing for ministry, continue to keep them in your prayers. Uh, pray that the Lord provides more and more people for the ministry. Um, and if you see someone around you, you think they have the gifts, no matter what age they are, you think they have the gifts to serve in a public ministry, tell them. Because I wouldn't be here doing this if somebody hadn't said to me, Charlie, this is what you ought to be doing. Uh, so when you see those gifts in others, make sure you recognize them um, and help us continue to grow as, as, uh, as a kingdom of God. Um, continue to keep me in your prayers. I love you all. God's blessings. Go be the man that God created you to be. Thank you for listening to the Gird Up Podcast. If you like what you're hearing on our podcast, make sure you're sharing it with friends and family, men in your life who you think need to hear our message. You can find us on social media, on Facebook under the Gird Up Podcast, and there's a Gird Up community as well there where you can interact with other men on the journey toward Christian manhood. You can find us on Instagram as Gird Up underscore like underscore a underscore man. If you'd like to help us bring our message to more men just like you all around the world, you can hit up our Patreon account. Type in www.patreon.com forward slash Gird Up. And finally, please leave a five-star rating or review on whatever platform you use to listen to our podcast, whether it's iTunes or Spotify. What that does is it helps us get more attention in the podcast world and bring more men to our message. Thank you again for listening to our podcast. Thank you for all the ways you support us and help spread the word. Until next time, go gird up and be the man that God created you to be.